All right, let's open up our Bibles to Matthew chapter 1. And this morning we'll also partake of, of communion. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ personally, then you need to make that right this morning before you partake of communion. Communion basically is just a memorial service of what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. And he gathered his disciples together and he told them, remember this as many times as you, you gather together. Just remember me is what he was saying to them. Remember what I'm about to do. And never forget it. And so we still do it to this day, have communion where we take the, the bread and the cup and we just remember what he has done for us. And so it's meaningful to those of us that know Jesus Christ. It, it, it's something that is close to our hearts. And we um, get excited about doing it every time because it's a reminder that we are one with God. And so prepare your hearts for that today. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, there's a simple remedy and that is just ask him into your heart. Ask him to be your Lord and Savior, and he'll come in, and he will be your Savior, and then you can partake with us also. Uh, all it means is that uh, you have a right relationship with him, and if you don't have one with him, then the communion is really meaningless. You know, There's no real reason to, to take it you know, unless you have that relationship, so we'll prepare our hearts this morning. Let's pray, and then we'll get into Matthew chapter 1. Lord, we, we thank you for this opportunity where, where we can dig into your word and, and find evidence, Father, of your son Jesus Christ existing, Lord. Lord, where we can uh, take a genealogy, just a bunch of names that are listed here in a, a certain order, and, and we can find some truth in it, Lord, uh, some exciting stories, uh, some evidence, Father, of Christ being the Messiah. And Lord, it can be life-changing, as we realize, Lord, that if you can use people like the Old Testament patriarchs, like the kings, like Jesus' forefathers, Lord, then you can also use us, uh, Father, because we too struggle in life and have flaws and sin that we deal with, Lord. But yet, Lord, you're far greater than all of that, Lord, and that you're able to take us and change us and use us for your glory, Lord. And we thank you for that, Lord, that it is your work in our lives. And it's exciting to see it all just unfold before us, Father. And so we give you glory, Lord, and honor for it. Minister to all of us here, to the broken hearts, Lord, to the struggles, Father. We pray that you need, meet their financial needs, Lord. We pray that you answer some, some questions, Lord, that people have this morning, Lord. We pray for a healing and a touch, Lord. And it all would be done, Lord, through your Holy Spirit, because you know every one of our hearts. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Do this really quick for me. Just put your hands together. <clears throat> Just kind of put them together. Now, that is so natural, isn't it? Doesn't it feel fine? Now, now switch the fingers over just one. Doesn't that feel weird? Isn't that weird? It's like, it feels unnatural, right? You know, and if you look at everyone, it's all different with each one of us because it's an unnatural thing. But the natural thing is to put them this way and it feels normal. It's because we're uniquely made, just like our fingerprints and our retina eyes and, and so forth. God has made us in a certain way because he loves us. He has a plan for us, a, a unique plan. We're, we're not all doing the same thing. We're doing different things. And so uh, he's <clears throat> equipped us in a certain way, in a certain manner to fulfill that plan for our life. And, and he loves us that much. He doesn't make us into a bunch of robots walking around saying the same thing. And so you're uniquely made. And I say that because as we go through the genealogies here, we're going we're gonna to see some people that you just question, well, how can they be in the line of Christ? Because they've done some pretty bad things, strange things. Um, incestual things even and we'll talk about those this morning but for those of you that don't know Jesus Christ or or question the validity of the Bible the Word of God uh, I want to ask you a question if I were to present to you this morning enough evidence that it would be clear in your mind would you accept Jesus Christ into your heart and then would you obey him if I gave you that evidence or would you kind of say no it wouldn't be enough 
then I want to just plant those seeds and water that this morning in your heart. That this is enough evidence that you can make that choice for Jesus Christ. Because in chapters 1 and 2, uh, Matthew tells us of Jesus the King. And he describes his kingship. And he gives the evidence of his kingship without a shadow of a doubt. And we should recognize him as the king. And also recognize that we're not the king. That he is the king and he is the only one that sits upon the throne. But we are children of the king. If we have accepted Jesus Christ into our heart, then he has made us his children. Now that that is not to say that we have certain rights and that we're better than someone else or we can usurp our authority or suggest that, that someone shouldn't even approach me because I'm a child of the king. No, by all means, the opposite. It should humble us that we have the great privilege of being you know, a child of the king. I raised four boys and each of the bo- those boys are so different even though I raised them all the same. And they're... They're all men of humility. They they all understand that neither one of them are better than the other. And I raised them that way and understand that. They don't have a certain right to me or to their mother because they're the number one son or the number two son or number three son. You know, they all have the same right uh, as the other does. And we love them all the same. And so with Jesus Christ, one is not above the other. Now we find... This event here of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, really throughout the scriptures, you can go all the way back to the Old Testament, find it in Genesis, you can find it in Chronicles, even in the book of Ruth, uh, those few chapters, you see a genealogy at the end in Kings, and so we find genealogies throughout the scriptures, which is unique. We also find it in Luke chapter 3, and in Luke, we see the genealogy being traced from Joseph, Mary's husband, the stepfather of Jesus, all the way back to Adam. So they have a genealogy that traces all the way back to Adam. And then in Matthew, we see the genealogy actually go from Abraham, the father of the Jewish people, to Jesus Christ going forward there. So a little bit unique. Matthew's genealogy is a little more concise version of all the genealogies. The genealogy in the Old Testament in 1 Chronicles chapters 1 through 9 really is the backbone of all genealogies, and you can look that up later. Now, it might seem that Matthew is starting in a strange way by all of a sudden taking 17 verses and then giving us this genealogy. You know, it's, it's not something that you look forward to. Well, I want to read a bunch of genealogies, a bunch of names. You know, he begot this and that begot that, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like, what, is, what does this really mean? Why is he starting that way? Well, there's a reason for it, a specific reason for it. In fact, the Jews understand it completely. Why? The historian Josephus, who was a Jewish historian, not necessarily a believer, he wrote his autobiography and he talks about his genealogy in the very beginning. You see, the Jews kept good records of genealogies. They actually had a city hall and you can go down there and you could trace back your record. You can look your name up and you can see who your father was and your father's father and go all the way back as far as you could trace it until the tribes of Israel and then all the way to Adam. And Josephus, a historian, when he wrote his autobiography, that's exactly what he did. He went to the records, got them, and then he wrote his genealogy in the beginning of his book. Now, it's interesting that as you read the Gospels, none of the religious leaders ever questioned Jesus' genealogy. They never shouted out, well, you're not really of you know, the tribe of Judah. We have evidence that your genealogy is incorrect. You know, they accepted it. Why? Because they could go to the city hall and look it up for themselves and find it. And I'm probably more than sure, though subjective, that, that they probably didn't find anything that Matthew's account of the genealogy, being a Jew, a tax collector, an educated person, uh, one that knew how to write, oftentimes tax collectors were also recorders too. And so he went to the city hall and he found Jesus' genealogy and he wrote it down. And without any error whatsoever. And so it is a full genealogy that's concise to Abraham. Why Abraham? Because Abraham is the father of the Jews. They understood that. And so they accepted Jesus' genealogy. If you accept Jesus' genealogy, then guess what? You have to accept who Jesus is. And we know that Jesus Christ claimed to be God in the flesh. He claimed to be the Messiah. And that's where they struggled. Was Jesus the Messiah? Was he the Christ? 
Was he the one that was going to come and deliver the children of Israel from the hands of the Roman Empire? So we also find in in Matthew's account here that he does omit, those of you that may have studied this a little more deeply, he does omit certain people like Ahab, Jezebel. These are people, in fact, their whole family that came from Ahithahel, the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. They were wicked people in the Old Testament. He doesn't mention them at all in this genealogy. We don't know why. Could it be because they were so wicked and evil that he didn't want to list them in there? Or could it be that he wanted to keep the genealogies in in a certain group form? Because the first section today, verses 1 through 6, we're going to go through 14 generations. Next week, we'll go through the next 14 and then the following 14. The first 14 deal with the patriarchs and thus the theme today the patriarchs verses one through six the patriarchs were the heads of their families or the heads of the tribes the next 14 generations deal with the kings from david all the way through the captivity of babylon he deals with the kings proving that jesus not only is from the patriarchs but also from the kings and then the last 14 deals with just those who came before christ's birth there in Bethlehem. <clears throat> so we really don't know why he omits them, but he does omit them, and I'm sure you could probably dig up some other ideas as to why he would omit them. Now we do know that um, that the Jews were good at keeping records, and because of that, Herod in AD 70 decided that he would destroy all records. And that makes sense because Herod, you remember when Jesus was uh, born or going to be born, the Magi's came in and they began to ask questions on where is the king. Herod got word of that and so he sought out to find this king also. Couldn't find him so he made a command to go out to kill every child all the way up until the age of two. And so that's why we believe that Jesus may have been two during that time. He wanted to make sure he killed every child, possibility of a king that was born. He wanted to be the only king. And so then later on, he got rid of the genealogies so that you couldn't trace back who the Messiah was. And so you had to accept him as the king. Unfortunately, the Messiah still came and it was still Jesus Christ who fulfilled that truth. So in verses 1 through 17... We have the genealogy of Christ from Abraham to Joseph. And then from 18 to 25, we actually have the birth of Christ through Mary. Now, Matthew answers two basic questions as we go through this. Who is Jesus Christ? Who is Jesus Christ? That's important for us. Who is he? I know that was important to me. And I mentioned it last week, I believe, or Wednesday night. Uh, Not only that he was a man, not only that he was the Messiah, that he walked among us, but that he was also God. That's important to me because him being God means that it settles everything, that he was capable of doing the things that he did. He was capable of being the sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice, though that's hard to believe that a man could be God. But when you read the scriptures, it's very clear that he claimed to be God. So who is Jesus Christ? Uh, Who do you think he is? That was a question that was going around with the religious leaders, the disciples. Who do men say that I am? Some thought he was a prophet. Some thought that he was a great moral teacher. Some didn't know. Um, It was Peter that says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And that was the correct answer. And then the other question was, where does he come from? Who is he and where does he come from? That's important to know. Does he have the pedigree? Do we have the evidence that he comes from where he says he comes from? Or is he just a man disguised to be the Messiah? Did he all of a sudden just show up out of the blues? You know, you had to prove that you were who you were. And so you could go down the city hall, pull up the records and show your genealogy. So verses 1 through 6 is the first 14 generations from Christ uh, uh, for Christ from Abraham to David. So let's go ahead and read the, the verses there. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob. Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and, and Zerah and T- by Tamar. Perez begot Hazor and Hezron begot Ram and Ram begot Abimadad. Bimadad begot Nishon, and Nishon begot Salmon, and Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth, and Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. And we'll stop right there. 
We'll hit verse 6 next week as we look at the kings. And so we have a list of patriarchs, as I mentioned earlier. Patriarchs were the male heads of the families in the tribe. And, and it starts with Abraham, who is, who is really the father of all patriarchs. Uh, you remember Jesus encountered the religious leaders and, and they told Jesus, well, we're of our father Abraham. Where are you from? And Jesus came back, of course, like he always does with, with a profound statement. Well, before Abraham was, I am. I'm like, what? Wow. I am. I mean, in other words, I've existed. I've always been. You know? And they're like, what are you talking about? You're only 30 years old. You know? How can you say I am? Because I am. And he was referring to uh, the encounter with Moses, who was way before Abraham, the burning bush there that he is. And he's everything that anyone needs him to be. But he starts with with David here in the next generations, and he talks about the kingship of Jesus Christ also. So in verse 1, he says, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And so Matthew, through the Spirit, sets in order the pedigree of Jesus Christ here. Now the word Christ, Jesus Christ, uh, sometimes we think that it's his last name. Some think it's his last name. His name was Jesus, his last name Christ. No, his last name we don't know. The word Christ in the Greek means Messiah or anointed. So Jesus meaning Jehovah or Yeshua, or we get the word Joshua even from it, actually means um, Savior. And so his title really is Jesus, the Savior, the Christ, or the Messiah. So Jesus, the Messiah, is his title and name. Matthew gives proof of his kingship, right to rule and reign, not just radically, but also royally. So not just as a patriarch, as a head of his home, but also as a king, royally, one that demands worship. Uh, By tracing Jesus' ancestry back to King David through the line of the Davidic uh, kingship, Matthew connects Jesus to that royal heritage. Now, there are some skeptics that don't believe that the Bible is the word of God, and and I understand that because they haven't had that relationship with Jesus Christ, so it's hard for them to accept that this book could be God's word, and, and they believe that a bunch of guys got together and wrote it. But if you were to just read it from Genesis to to Revelation, and I've done that over and over and over again, it is an amazing book. It is not just a a book. It it is scientifically proven, historically accurate, um, textually, just textually in itself. When you look at textual criticism and how you criticize a text, the evidence is just so clear that it wasn't uh, one individual human man, but it was one supreme God that wrote this. The story just seems to flow from Genesis all the way to Revelation, just just so consistently and, and clearly that you know that someone higher than the guys writing it wrote the book. And it is amazing how scientifically you can prove it to be the word of God. And so these skeptics that are out there um, really aren't reading it and approaching it in the right manner. They're approaching it really prejudicedly because they have their own biases towards Jesus Christ himself, the man. And it's not necessarily against the book. It's against the man, Jesus Christ. They don't like what he stands for. They don't like what he represents. And so they'll do anything to destroy him and any document that surrounds him or historical evidence that surrounds him, which should give us an idea that if they hate him that much, there's got to be something there. You know, There's got to be something there. So it's historically accurate. Now we're here because we have a genealogy. Of Jesus Christ and so if Jesus has a genealogy then there's the historical evidence that he is who he says he is God in the flesh Paul even called him God when you look at Romans chapter 5 verse 4 this is what Paul said of the Israelites and then he says of Jesus Christ he says who are the Israelites there's that question who's Jesus well who are the Israelites to whom pertain the adoption that adoption into the kingdom of God the glory the covenant that God made with them the giving of the law the 10 commandments the service of God and the promises that God gave to the Israelites of whom are the fathers and from whom according to the flesh Christ came so in a sense he's giving a little genealogy there in Romans chapter 5 verse 4 who are the Israelites 
These are the people, the covenant people. These are the people that had the promise. These are the people that brought Christ into the world. And then he says of Christ, who is over all. Speaking of Christ, he's over all. And the eternally blessed God. The eternally blessed God. And then he says, A man to that jesus is god i love his little epistles in titus and in timothy because he calls jesus our god and savior very clear that jesus is god and so he is the son of god but he's also the son of david there in the next statement the son of david of david in second samuel 7 16 he says your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you your throne shall be established forever now if david has a son and he becomes the king and god promised that his throne would be established forever should we not have a throne today of david yeah if god says that your throne will be established forever if you go to israel today is there a palace and is there a throne is there an ancestor of david sitting on that throne no so he can't be talking physically. He's talking spiritually. He's talking about Jesus being the son of David, as he says there, Matthew, the son of David. So he's saying, spiritually speaking, Jesus is on the throne eternally. That's the only way possibly this fulfillment can take place in Second Samuel 7, because God had promised to Abraham and God had promised to David to fulfill that promise. So Jesus is both the king and also a king's son. Isn't that interesting? If Jesus was before Abraham, it always existed. John chapter 1 verse 1, right? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then verse 14 says he became flesh and dwelt among us speaking of jesus christ always existed from the beginning so if he existed he was always king and yet he was born through the line of david so he's also the son of david yet he precedes david interesting how that works but the evidence is clear also the son of abraham the son of abraham the patriarch and our father you know if you go to even to israel today and you talk to a jewish person they will say that they are children of abraham they still believe that to this day. This is a great book to give to your Jewish friends. You know, to show them that Jesus is very Jewish and even has the genealogy to prove his Jewishness and that he is the Messiah also. You know, and approaching them that way. And so of Abraham, God said in Genesis twenty two eighteen, In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Now again, he's speaking spiritually because are all the nations blessed? No, only those nations who align themselves with the Jewish people. God has chosen one family line, and that line is Abraham. And later on, he goes from Abraham to David, and then from David to, to, um, ooh, to the ancestors of David, the kings, and then to Jesus Christ, ultimately, who will be the, the promised uh, Messiah. The Lord had promised to Abraham in Genesis 26, 4, In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And so if we love Israel and we bless Israel, God says he'll bless us. I think that's why our nation is blessed. Isn't our nation blessed? We're a unique nation. There is no other nation like our nation. Never has there been another nation like our nation. Everybody wants to be us. And it's sad that, that our president today wants to destroy that whole system and bring about a socialized system i i totally disagree with that god has created us with such wisdom and understanding that we can overcome anything as long as we put our faith and trust in him it's when we don't it is this great nation that that really is a light to all other nations that want to be like us and the only reason we're like we are is because our ancestors the pilgrims they believed in Jesus Christ. They believed in Israel. They supported Israel. Completely supported Israel. The Jews back then even supported the pilgrims moving into this new land here, America. And so we're blessed because of our relationship. And so that has been fulfilled in that through Abraham, even other nations are blessed. No other nation in the world is blessed like we are. Even the women in this great nation are blessed because of what God has done in freeing up and liberating uh, women. Look at some of the nations that are out there that aren't Christians. 
And look at how they oppress the women. Look at the Muslim nation. They oppress the women. It's only Christianity that, that really raises women up. So Abraham was very much honored by the Jews and honored by the world, and thus they would be blessed because of that relationship. Matthew said that Jesus is the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, these few words sum up the collimation of the entire Old Testament, the long-awaited promised Messiah, the restorer of the kingdom of God, the redeemer of his people is Jesus himself. And this is Matthew's central message that he presents in this genealogy. And so he says in verse 2, Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Doesn't mention the 11 brothers. He just says Judah. Why Judah? Because he's in the line of Christ. The other brothers were not. Your NIV might put it this way, which is a little clear. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah. So these are the patriarchs, the heads of their different homes and tribes. Abraham begot Isaac. You can read his story in Genesis chapter 21 through 22. I encourage you to go back. Write that down in your Bible right there and go back and read these stories. They're wonderful stories and they'll encourage you. Abraham was a man of faith. He's a great example of a person that believes in God in his word. Believes that God will fulfill his promises. It was God that told Abraham, I want you to leave your nation. I want you to leave your people. I want you to trust in me, and I'm going to make you into a great nation. And he did. He left. And he believed God, and God blessed him because of that. And then that covenant that God gave to Abraham, he also gave to Isaac. And Isaac, uh, you can read his story in Genesis also, uh, 23 through 24. Another uh, miraculous story there on how he came about. Uh, you remember God promised Abraham and Sarai a son. And of course they were like almost 100 years old and they had not a son yet. And so what did they do? And the, the thing that sticks out to me with this story is how we handle uh, steps of faith, how we want to sometimes get our hands involved in what God is doing. And we really need to take our hands out of it and let God do it. Because God promised them you will have a son, and through that son, <clears throat> the Messiah will come. Well, Abraham and Sarah were waiting, and they couldn't wait any longer. So they thought, well, if, if he's saying that we'll be blessed through a son, let's give him a son. Here, here's my servant uh, maid, so take her. Lay with her. Have a relationship with her, and then the son that comes from her will be the promise that God gave us. And so they did that. It didn't work out. It was more trouble than anything else. And then finally, Abraham had this connection with this young man, which makes sense. A father and a firstborn son. Yeah, there's going to be a connection there. You know, and God tells Abraham, you need to listen to your wife. And the wife was really uh, getting upset because now their born son, Isaac, and the son were battling over who would be in charge. So God told Ishmael and uh, the maid to leave. And so Abraham had to listen to his wife and kick them out of the home. But God took care of them. And they became the Muslim nation that we know of the Arabs today. So what an interesting story. Jacob, another one. Genesis 25, you can read his story. Him and his brother Esau, how he stole the right from his brother. You know, he's always been a conniver. He's the guy that wanted to take Esau's birthright. So his brother was a man of the earth. He was a strong man, smelly man, you know, hairy man, a man's man. And so Jacob was a mama's boy. You know, he just hung around mom all day long, you know. And, and so the mom says, well, why don't you take Esau's blessing? And so they, they got wool and they put it all over him, kind of glued him like he, like it was a hairy man. And then he snuck into Isaac's uh, room and Isaac was kind of blind, couldn't see. And he says, you sound like Jacob. Come here. You smell like Esau though, you know, and you're hairy too. So he gave him the blessing. Interesting stories. I mean, these are people that God used to bring about the the line of Christ, to bring, a, bring in the Messiah into the world. And then Jacob, son, Judah, and then the brothers. But Judah is through the line of Christ. You can read his story in Genesis 49, Deuteronomy 33. He's the fourth son of Jacob. This guy is really interesting. If you haven't read his story, you got to read his story in full. Let me just tell you really quickly. Here's the fourth son of Jacob. <clears throat> 
He has two, three children of his own, three males. His firstborn marries a woman named Tamar. Well, Tamar and her husband try to have relationships, but he dies. The custom was, if your husband dies, then the next kin in line, for a reason, again, because of the tribes and keeping everyone in their specific tribes, the next son in line would marry her. So she took the next brother in line, and she married him. Well, then he dies. And then so Judah's thinking, boy, this woman's a black widow. You know, she's like killing my sons off. So he says, you know what? Uh, my third son and only son, kind of young. Let's wait a little bit. And so he's kind of putting her off in a sense and, and making excuses. You're not taking him, you know. And so what she does is she decides that she's just going to go live in town. And then one day Judah, <clears throat> this is where it gets bad, he decides he's going into town to hire a prostitute. And so there Tamar is. She puts a veil over her head and pretends to be a prostitute. So Judah comes and says, hey, how much to, you know, hire you, in, in a sense. And she's like, well, I don't know, what do you got? He goes, I've got a lamb. Okay, I'll take that. Where is it? Well, I don't have it with me. Well, what do you have with you? He goes, I've got my signet ring. So I'll give it to you until my servant can come back and pay you the lamb. Okay, I'll take it. So she takes it. He lies with her. What a bad guy, huh? He goes away. Tells a servant, take her a lamb. He goes in to find her, nowhere to be found. In fact, nobody's ever even heard of her. She's not someone that's always there. You know, talk about a manipulator, huh? And manipulating the story. And so she then goes into hiding. Nine months later, people start talking. Tamar's pregnant. And Judah starts thinking, aha, we can get rid of her now. And then my son will be fine. We'll just judge her, take her to the wall, and they'll stone her. So he then brings accusations against her. And she says, well, the husband of my child is the one who owns this signet ring. And Judah, can you imagine his face going? <sighs> you know, and that's why it says that she was more righteous than I am. That's what he said. He was caught right in his tracks. That's the family that Jesus had. <laughs> you know, that's pretty amazing. And of course, the child is born, and then Tamar brings into uh, the family Perez and Zerah, who were born by Tamar. And these two were twins. They were twins of Tamar. <clears throat> and then they begot Hazran, and Hazran begot Ram. Now, Tamar is just one of the women that are in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. There are other women that are also in that genealogy. Now, you can read about these illegitimate sons in uh, Ruth chapter 4, but also Genesis chapter 38, and read that story concerning Judah. It's a great read and really encourage you. So not only Tamar, but there was also another woman, and you know her as Rahab. Children of Israel were entering into the promised land as God told them to. Land of Canaan, they came to Jericho. They send two spies out, <clears throat> and they meet a harlot who's living up in the higher parts of the wall. Uh, the city walls went around Jericho, and that's where the guards would stand and be watchmen to see if anyone was attacking. Well, they climbed through, and as they climbed through to search out to see what kind of forces they had and so forth, this woman who had heard about the God of Israel and how powerful this God was decided that she was going to hide them as the spies were being sought out by, by the guards. So she hit them. And then when she let them go out the wall, <clears throat> she said, remember me. Make sure you don't destroy me and my family. And they said, well, just put a scarlet thread out your window. So remember me. And that speaks of Jesus' blood, the covering, like the children of Israel on Passover where they put blood upon the post. You know, and so they remembered her. But through her, we see a harlot. And again, the, the line of Christ comes through blood stain. Another harlot. Then there's um, not only Rahab, but there's also Ruth. She's Gentile. She's not even Jewish. You know the Jews hate Gentiles. They won't even walk close to a Gentile, let alone eat from the same bowl as a Gentile, because they were dogs. In fact, they had a saying that uh, Jews would say, you know, thank God that, that, um, 
that we don't associate with dogs and, and unclean things and women, you know, also. It's like that's how they looked and viewed the Gentiles and even women itself. And then to be a Gentile woman was even worse. And with Ruth, she was hated and not only hated but cursed by God because of the sin that the Moabites had committed. And so they were cursed to never uh, dwell in the temple of God. And yet here we see Ruth marries Boaz to bring David into the line of Jesus. And again, there's, and you can see this in verse 6, Bathsheba. And she's not even mentioned, though. They don't even say her name. They just say the wife of Uriah, but they mean Bathsheba. And she was the one that was bathing on the rooftop as David was overlooking his great city, probably in pride. This is my great city, what I've you know, built here. And there she is in the middle of the night, bathing naked on a rooftop in a tub. What's going on there? You know, and so he sees that and decides to send some men down there. And we'll talk about that at the, the end there. So another woman there. So it, it just really seems like, like Jesus' genealogy is not a really reputable one, right? You know, it makes me feel better, <laughs> you know, that, that I didn't come from such a shady background, though my background's pretty shady personally, you know, but my mothers and fathers were, you know, hardworking people that came, you know, here through, through Mexico and El Paso and just tried to make a living. Not like Jesus, but isn't it interesting how God will use certain people to receive the glory? So we see here that Perez begot Hezron and Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Abimadad, and Abimadad begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon. Now, I have no idea who those people are. We find them in Ruth chapter 4, verse 18 to 22. <clears throat> we find them in, in uh, I think, I believe it was Genesis or Kings in another little genealogy, but we really don't know what they've done. And so it, it, it's silent when it comes to uh, these patriarchs. For whatever reason, God didn't have much to say about them. Maybe they were worse than the others, I don't know. It's only a supposition. So verse 5, Solomon begot Boaz by Rahab. And Rahab was that Canaanite prostitute at the wall that we were, we were speaking about. And Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Now, interesting story there. You can read about Ruth in the book of Ruth, the four chapters that are written there. And it's a love story without ever using the word love how these two met. And it's really an example, a typology of Jesus, who was Boaz, and Ruth, which is the type of the church. And so you see this relationship between Boaz and Ruth, Christ and the church. When you read it, you'll notice that Boaz is a kinsman redeemer. A kinsman redeemer and that he was next in line. If his brother or ancestor had died, that he was next in line to marry that person, just like we saw with Judah. And so Ruth comes along, and he's not the next one in line. There's one before him. So now he has to fight him or cunningly take Ruth away from him. And so he comes and does the tradition of removing the sandals of his brother's, uh, <clears throat> brother's foot to signify that he doesn't want anything to do with her and that uh, he's unworthy. And then that gave Boaz the right to become the kinsman redeemer. So we see Boaz at a cost redeeming Ruth, which is Christ in the church again. And then Ruth coming and laying by the feet of Boaz in that relationship. And that's why John the Baptist, when, when Jesus came, you remember he said, I'm not worthy to untie his shoes. He's speaking of Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, of Jesus, the kinsman redeemer of the church. So interesting. So you can read that in the book of Ruth. We know her husband passed away. They decided to go to Moab and find greener pastures there. Again, just kind of like some of us, like, the world is a better place, but then we find that it's not as good as we, we thought it was. And then Obed begot Jesse. And Jesse begot David, the king. David, the king, begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. And this is a reference to Bathsheba. <clears throat> now we'll talk about David next week. But here we have a woman who was bathing on the top of the roof and David... Uh, lusted for her basically and went into her and she was pregnant so here is David the king uh, committing adultery and having a child out of a wedlock breaking all God's commandments completely he's in the line of Christ what's interesting about this story that is encouraging is is Uriah the husband of Bathsheba here's a guy that 
loved his king and loved his, his nation. That he was on the front line fighting in battle. David literally went out and found him from the battle lines and brought him home because he found out Bathsheba was pregnant. And so he was hoping that he could get them together, you know, reunite them. And then she'll say, I'm pregnant. And they would think it was Uriah's child. <clears throat> well, David fed him and got him drunk and said, now go home, lay with your, your wife. <clears throat> he wakes up in the morning and he's laying in the front door. And he says, how can I go and lay with my wife when my fellow men are out there in the battlefields fighting for this great nation of ours? I was like, wow, there's a leader for you. One who's committed, uh, one who's, not, uh, who's willing to sacrifice and to give up privileges you know, for God. And so David decided, well, if I can't get him to go home, then I need to get rid of him somehow. So David becomes a murderer now. Not only adulterer, a breaker of the commandments, but now a murderer. He tells his commander to take Uriah and put him on the front line where the battle is heated. And once he's up on the front line and the battle gets heated, he he tells his commander, ask the men to retract and Uriah will stay there. And that's exactly what happened. He was killed in that battle. A man that lived for his kingdom and for God and he even gave his life for it. Now, here's what's interesting is David, who committed all these sins and and should have rightly been judged, could have easily been taken to the wall and stoned for his crimes, but God has grace on him. And David repents from his heart. This is true repentance on David's part. And this is why God calls him a man after his own heart, because David truly had a heart for God, though he made some very dumb mistakes, big mistakes. He sends Nathan, a prophet, to David. And Nathan begins to tell David a story about how a man stole a little lamb that wasn't his. And David was so angry. He said, who is this man that we would go get him and kill him? And Nathan says, you're that man because you stole a beautiful little lamb from Uriah. Can you imagine David's face? Who told you, first of all? You know, well, God did, and you need to repent. And David did. He humbled himself and repented. Now, he went on. He went on to marry Bathsheba, and they had children, and then that's where Solomon came, uh, who was the wisest of all kings of Israel. So pretty amazing when you think about this. How God uses interesting people, isn't it? Here we see God bringing about the line of Christ through the patriarchs. And he chooses interesting men. And chooses Gentile women to be in that lineage. It tells us that God likes to choose people that that others would not choose. It tells us that God doesn't always choose the wise, the educated, the pure the righteous, the holy, you know. He chooses those that are not. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians one twenty six. He says, for you see your calling, brethren. Now we're all called, are we not, as Christians? We're all called to be children of God and we're all called to be in some sort of ministry. We should be involved in one way or another. And that's pushed here a lot. You might hear that a lot here. Probably more than anywhere else, but because I really believe it. And that's why we have 40% of the church involved in ministry because of that. So Paul says, you see your calling. You know you have a calling. God's called you to something. He said that not many wise according to the flesh. He doesn't call the wise when it comes to the flesh. You know, we don't have, all have educations. We don't go to the best colleges We don't have the best grades. Uh, We're not bookworms, you know. Uh, We're not wise people according to the flesh, he's saying. Not many mighty, you know, not all strong and mighty and able to do, you know, great tasks. Not many noble are called. Then he says in verse 27, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world. But he chooses foolish things like me and like you. We're foolish things. And we are the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, he said. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the abased things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. That's why he chooses them. I think it was Chuck Swindoll, I was listening to him 
and he's a great teacher he's an educated teacher and, and you know this is not by any means the rule you know but this is the majority of God's choosing but there are those that are educated and, and he would teach at a university Bible college and teach all kinds of young people and he said one of his main concerns were not for the underclass but for the overachievers he said, I pray more for those men and women that are beautiful, that are handsome creatures of God, and that are really educated, really smart. It just, it just comes so easy. I pray more for them than for the others. And he said, because they have a tendency to take the glory from God, because they think it's their work, their beauty, their talents, their education, where those that are less are just going, God, if you can just use this donkey, you know, if you can do something, you know, whatever it is, find something. And though I don't even feel like it's good enough, but, you know, if anything good comes out of it, that's the heart that we should all have. That's the heart that Pastor Chuck has, has given to us <clears throat> to have, is that it's not our work. I taught at a um, <clears throat> breakfast the other week. And Chuck has embedded that in my heart. And I know it's hard to understand for people to really grasp this. But after I taught the, the, the men's study, <clears throat> one of the guys came up to me and said, really thank you for coming out and, and sharing with us. And I says, no, no, thank God. He goes, no, I want to thank you. And so I says, no, okay, thank God. He goes, no, you, you had to get up in the morning and you had to put your clothes on and you had to bring your Bible and you had to stand here before us, so thank you. And I'm just like, he doesn't get it. He just doesn't get it. So I just says, okay, thank you, you're welcome. You know, they don't get it. See, they don't understand that there was a time where you could not get me up and out of my bed. You could not get me to put clothes on to even step a foot into a church. God had to do that. God had to come into my heart. God had to change me to even want to get up, to read the Bible, and then to stand up in front of people and to even share. That's God's work, not my work, so thank Him. You get it? Not me. Even the breath that I breathe is not my own. It's His. Our hearts are involuntary muscles. You can't control them. Who's controlling our hearts? God. He's the one that's pumping it. Come on, try to stop your heart. It won't do. Ugh, stop, stop. You know, I can flex my bicep and, you know, that type of thing, but not your heart because God's in total control. And that's what he's saying here through Paul. Look, I, I choose the weak things. People pick a person and say, he should be teaching. He's eloquent. He speaks very well. And he stands up there and it's like, yeah, that's me. He's receiving the glory. That's why you have ministries that are, that are out there and they use their name instead of Jesus Christ. Yeah. I want Jesus to be known. Even on my tombstone, the one who served Jesus. That's what I'd like to put on it. Nothing else. Because you know? it doesn't matter who I am. It's who he is. And so Paul says he chooses those weak things. And if he chose Judah a manipulator, a, foreign, a man who committed incest and laid with his daughter-in-law. <clears throat> if he chose Ruth and Tamar and, and Rahab, you know, these, these women that were harlots and prostitutes to bring the light, then yeah, he can use us too. He can use me. And that's encouraging as long as we bring glory to the, to the Lord. So the evidence is clear. My question again, if you are presented the evidence, would you give your life to the Lord and would you be obedient? That, that stands with you. You have to make that decision. I can't make that for you. It has to be in your heart to say, yes, Lord, I want you in my life and I will obey you because I feel like I am an abased thing. I'm not very mighty. I'm foolish. I'm not wise. I'm weak and I need someone to strengthen me like you.